OK, so one, one technique to do this is to, let's say, take the TLB, and instead of having the TLB in front of our cache, put our TLB, let's say, in parallel or after, after our cache. So what this means is the addresses that go into our cache are virtual addresses. And this has some pretty big implications. Um, lots of processors are doing this uh, these days, where they will actually put the TLB in parallel with the cache. And this picture is a little bit confusing because it looks like this is after the cache. To some extent, it is and it isn't, depending on how you sort of squint and look at this. Um, if the cache is completely virtually indexed and virtually tagged, it would look something like this. Because you only go fire up the TLB when you take a cache miss. And you have to go out to uh, farther out layers of memory. Now, if you have uh, a virtually indexed but physically tagged cache, and what that means is the address that goes into the index of the cache array is a virtual address. But then you do the TLB access in parallel, and out comes a physical address. And then you do the compare, the tag match on the physical addresses. That makes a lot of, lot of things a lot easier in life, and we'll, we'll look at that in a second. So one of the major, major challenges that you end up with here with virtually indexed caches that I wanted to point out is you start to get some aliasing problems. What do I mean by this? Well, before, when you were to go put something in the cache, it could only be basically one place in a direct map cache in a n-way associative cache it could be in the n different places. So a two-way set associative cache could be in the two ways. But you knew where to look for it, at least. But all of a sudden, if you start to have bits above the minimum page size in the address feed into where it is in the cache, it could actually be in multiple places in the cache. So brief example here. We have a 32-bit address. We have our cache offset here. We have, let's say, a page size of 4 kilobytes. So that's going to be, what, 12 bits. And let's say our cache index or our cache, rather, has, I don't know, more than four kilobytes in it. So all of a sudden, we have a direct mapped cache, which has eight kilobytes. Uh-oh. So this, this bit here, so this, this is our index. Sorry. Uh, our index into our cache has one bit here above the page boundary. And the OS could elect to have this bit here be a 0 or a 1. So what that means is all of a sudden, when we go to index into our cache, the same physical piece of memory might be in two different locations. Or depending on how the operating system sort of lays out memory, you might look in the wrong spot, or you might need to check both places. So we have to start thinking about this, that the bits above the minimum page size, if our cache is bigger than our minimum page, minimum page size, the bits are not going to match. And we're, we'll walk through an example of that in a second. Also, um, virtually addressed caches have some other, other challenges here. Um, because two applications can have the same virtual addresses. And let's say your time multiplex between application one and application two, all of a sudden these two applications are going to go into your cache. And you might have one application hitting on the data of another application. So if two applications are trying to go access address five, and they have different values stored at address five, in our virtually indexed cache, all of a sudden you might start to get something weird here. You might actually end up where 
if, if you don't protect against this, one process is reading another process's data out of the cache. So you need to protect against this. And there's a couple different approaches. One approach is actually just to flush the cache on every context swap. So every time you change processes, flush the whole cache. That sounds really expensive, but believe it or not, that's actually done with uh, non-trivial non uh, probability, in, or that actually is done in some actual real uh, systems out there. A little bit uh, nicer way to do this is to have address space identifiers. So you actually tag the cache with an address space ID, and it's part of the tag information. So it's not just the address, virtual address that matters, but it's also which process ID or which address space ID. So it's another sort of thing, but that increases your tag bits. So you've got to be a little bit uh, careful about that. So this is mostly about having a virtually indexed, virtually addressed cache. Or virtually, excuse me, virtually indexed, virtually tagged cache. And if we look at this, how this uh, fits into the, the pipeline, life actually gets a lot, lot better from a hardware perspective. Um, this is sort of summing up what we saw before. You really have to do, only have to do translate on cache miss. So your, your maiden processor pipeline looks the same as what we've been drawing up to this point. But on cache miss, you have to go through either your instruction translation look aside buffer or your data look aside buffer, or uh, uh, data translation look aside buffer. So to sort of sum up this a little bit more pictorially here, what's happening with virtually addressed caches, let's. Um, Take a, take a little bit of a, a gander at this uh, example here. So we have two virtual addresses, virtual address one, virtual address two. And the operating system elects to map those to the same physical page in memory. This is something that virtual memory systems do many times. Sometimes you want to have a memory hole where you have memory mapped twice, or you want to have a piece of memory mapped between two different applications to share data. Pretty common thing to have happen. So you want to share some physical memory. Unfortunately, if you go look at our uh, virtual addressed cache here, we actually end up with it in two different locations. This is going back to that example there. You have a first copy here and a first copy there. And it depends on where it actually was located in the virtual address space, which has no mapping to where it actually should be located in the physical address space. So the bits don't match. The bit of the virtual address uh, here and the bit of the, the physical address in this bit here does not match. And that, that causes a, uh, uh, a world of, of problems because all of a sudden you can have, let's say, that even the same application write to address, let's say, 10 and write to address uh, 4,096 plus 10 and they're supposed to be mapping to the same location. It's supposed to be the same address. Um, but you can write five, and then the other, using the other name for that same location, it'll read, let's say, 1,000 or just some random number out of there. So there are, there's a couple techniques to, uh, to deal with this. And I don't want to go into too much detail. Your uh, book goes into some more detail. But just to give you a little bit of an insight on how to, how, to, how to go about solving this, there's some systems out there which actually require that the virtual indexed piece of memory or the, uh, resides in the same location as another page of that same address in the cache. Now, you sit there and you scratch your head and you might say, well, is this effectively decreasing our associativity of our cache or, or moving things around in our cache? Well. A little bit is the answer. But um, these are sort of the trade-offs. And the OS can, to some extent, manage this, this different layout. And uh, that's what I was saying here. And early, early Sparks actually used um, a system like this, where it ensures that the uh, virtual addresses accessing the address in the PA will not uh, conflict in a direct map cache in a, in a, in a bad way. So, so you're going to guarantee you'll always go to the same location. So that's sort of the beginning point. If you have virtually indexed and virtually tagged, but you can have other, other mixes of these things. And not all of them make sense. 
Um, you can have physically indexed, physically tagged. That's what we've been talking about uh, at the beginning of, of last lecture. That was the sort of the simple case. Virtually indexed, virtually tagged. That has lots of challenges, we'll say. Virtually indexed physical tags. Now, this is actually a really good trade-off here. So you do the translation in parallel with the cache access, and then you do the tag check. You don't actually need to have um, ACIDs in this case, uh, address space identifiers, because you're guaranteed to have the correct physical match. You, know, you might be accessing, let's say, the wrong location in the cache, or you might be accessing the wrong location. So we don't get around this uh, virtual physical problem and being in two locations. We'll talk about that in a second. You still need to handle that sort of in the, the Spark way, but at least you don't have to have address space identifiers, and at least you don't have to flush your cache on every process swap. Because you're guaranteed that the, the check that you do on the cache miss or hit is exact, because you're doing a, a physically indexed, uh, excuse me, a physically tagged cache. <clears throat> and then you can have something what we'll call both indexed and physically tagged. This is a cute little trick that a lot of uh, architectures play, is they just want to ignore all these problems. And they want to make something that looks like a physically indexed, physically tagged cache, but they still want to have a cache that's bigger than their uh, minimum page size. So you have a 4K minimum page size, and you want to have an 8 kilobyte cache. If you have a direct mapped cache, this bit here, the one above the, the, the page size, is going to be part of your tag index, but it's not, uh, it doesn't fall into, uh, so it's part of your tag index, but you're not gonna be able to control it. But what you can do is let's say you take your eight kilobyte cache and you make it two-way set associative. So all of a sudden it's eight kilobytes, but it reduces the number of index bits you have and it fits within your index into the cache. So it's a cute little trick here that you have. It's virtual and physical. The virtual and the physical addresses below the page size are the same. So the index into the cache doesn't get changed after you go through address translation. So you'll see this where people actually add associativity to their L1 caches just to avoid having to do address translation. And then you do address translation in parallel and you do physically tagged and do the, 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 the tag check physically. There's this other one down here that I had to have a X through. I, haven't really, I don't think I've actually ever seen one of these built. You can, because it kind of doesn't make sense. Having a physically indexed, virtually tagged cache yeah, not sure why you'd want to do that. Uh, because usually the hard part is coming, uh, generating the, the address to stick into the cache. So I have, I've never actually seen one of these, but it's always possible to go, go build something like that. But it's something to think about that having, if, if all of a sudden your cache size or the amount of index bits that go into your cache is more than the amount of bits in your minimum page size, your uh, addresses are going to show up in multiple places. And you have to either deal with that or uh, at least understand what's going on there. And it's usually done by the operating system. One, one final note, um, we've mostly been talking about multi-level page tables where you sort of index in and then you have a tree of pages that come out of it. This is only one approach. People have built stranger things out there and still implemented paging. That's only one structure to hold all the pages in. So one thing you can think about is if you have lots and lots of page tables, and they're all mapping, let's say, to the same, uh, they all look similar, you can try to share different portions of the page table, and many times the operating system does that. But another way to look at it is you can try to have a table which takes a physical page and maps it backwards to a virtual address. These are actually usually called inverted page tables. And on first appearance, this sounds weird because it's the map in the direction you don't want, you would think. But to make up for it, what usually architectures do to solve this problem, the people, the architectures that have had inverted page tables do to solve this problem, is they have a fast hashing uh, function and a really small hash map 
which does the correct direction. And then if they have the uh, slow direction, they basically sort of walk the page table and it's a complicated hashing scheme, but basically it's kind of one of those linked list hash functions. So you, you check one location in the uh, physical, the virtual table. If it's not there, there's a link to another location, another location, and if it's, um, it actually ends up working out not, not, too, not too bad, uh, but that's not very common today. So I just wanted to put it out there that you can actually have the idea, or you can have different arrangements of pages, and the canonical page table we talked about today, or uh, in class last time, was only one way to go about doing it. Okay, so questions on virtual memory caches? Before, yep. Ah, that's a good question. <laughs> so when you say page relocation, you're saying that the operating system takes a page and decides to move it in physical memory someplace else? Maybe you can address it and then put back in in a different location. So, um, you're saying because, yes, um, you're saying the cache could get stale. Yeah, so, so the problem is that, mm, let's see if he draws. Here we have a, a linear page table. We put in address 5,000 hexadecimal, and that maps to some location in our physical memory. Let's say, to make life easy, it maps to address uh, 8,000 hexadecimal. Now, the OS comes along and swaps this page out to disk. Sometime in the future, it decides to pull it back in. And it pulls it back in down here at uh, A000 hexadecimal. 8000 hexadecimal. And it updates the page table to point to there. Now, um, what Govan was trying to say is in our cache, we had some data that pointed to this physical memory that was in, in the cache. Now, all of a sudden, we, we go and we move everything around. Is this, is this a problem? Because we're basically going to uh, do a index, and the physical address that comes out is not going to match what was in there for that data. That's actually OK. We're just going to get a miss on that, that location. So we're just going to get a miss. And then it's basically going to evict it, and then go pull in that exact same piece of data. That's actually not so bad. Um, now, there are other subtle, subtle, more subtle challenges with these virtually indexed, virtually tagged. Uh, sorts of things that will many times require you when you go to do this remapping to actually invalidate all the memory that you kick out. Because you actually might get a hit, <laughs> even though it's pointing to the wrong location. So let's say the other, the other case is you're in a virtually indexed, virtually tagged cache. And we did this remapping, this exact same remapping here. Well, there's different physical memory underlying, underlying address 5,000 virtual now. And we want to make sure we don't take a hit on the old data, which is still in our cache. So typically, the scheme to go handle this is you actually have to invalidate all that memory out of your, uh, actually, it's typically flush and invalidate operation out of your cache. And uh, depending on what architecture you're on, some architectures actually have instructions that flush the entire cache. So x86 has something called write back and invalidate, which will actually flush the entire, it'll, it'll write back all the data and it'll flush the entire cache. Um, other architectures, so something more like MIPS, does it on a line by line basis. And it's a, basically an operating system only instruction where you can actually access uh, an address and given that address, um, or excuse me, you, you present an index into the cache and given that index, it'll, flush that data uh, cleanly. 
Now, um, then there's something sort of in the middle if you want to actually have the user be able, be able to do this sort of flushing. You need to think a lot harder about this because you want some way for the user to be able to present a virtual address but have that name something about the cache. Um, so there are some ways to do that, but um, it's kind of, the, the corner cases there get pretty tricky. But, so yeah, to, does that answer your question? So you, you, you get a miss when you go to access it uh, someplace else, and that's actually okay. Now, trickier thing is let's say the OS decides to point at this some other way. And let's say DMA or use another processor or something to go overwrite this piece of memory. Now your cache is stale. But this is sort of a more involved question going to if you have multiple processors, how do you keep multi memory from multiple processors coherent, which we're going to be talking about in two lectures about cache coherence between different processors. If it's on the same processor and it's accessed the same way, the cache is going to pick up that change. If it's accessed, let's say, some other way to that same address, the operating system's going to have to uh, be very careful, and this is why these virtually indexed, physically tagged uh, address, uh, caches usually require some way for the operating system not to have those bits differ. The bits match, you know you'll kick it out. So, um, and because it's physically tagged, even if you have a, uh, let's say, four-way set associative cache, you're going to get a hit on the physical address bits after the translation. So it's not like you can actually have, let's say, way zero and way one having the same piece of physical address data in it. That just can't happen in a cache because, the, on, a, on a physically tagged cache, because the physical tag information is going to be the same. 